thing that Thank you. So just a reminder, we do record uh, the meetings and uh, that will allow uh, residents and uh, anybody who is missing the meeting from the trustee board to actually review uh, the meeting. So I'm going to open it up and see if there are any comments regarding uh, January's minutes. And I don't see any hands up. Okay, so... We will go ahead and accept the minutes as they stand. Thank you. So I just wanted to give an update regarding, uh, we have a recommendation of our last um, vacancy. Um, the individual is Jordan Cantor. Uh, and so we're waiting for um, uh, Jordan to be appointed, but he has been recommended to the town council to be appointed. And so we're uh, not foreseeing any reasons that he will not uh, be joining us. And hopefully, oh, uh, I'm probably going to be corrected. So let me <laughs> stop right there before I say anything else that is not correct or appropriate. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, so I have not appointed him yet. So he has not gone to the town council. So, you know, it's not in, so you just know whose court is and we're having conversations. So it's not quite, it's not there yet. Sorry, then I we yeah. sort of uh, <laughs> yeah. we we got a little ahead of ourselves here, but we do hope um, that the vacancy will be filled, uh, especially before we actually all meet to have our first kickoff for our action planning. So we're very excited. Once um, uh, the process is completed, then um, Carol and I will confirm with everyone um, that the individual is who I just said it was, and that uh, they will join us in terms of our action plan. And we're hoping that. Um, that uh, the individual will be joining us this evening. Um, okay, sorry about that, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, all right, the next item on the agenda is the update on Wayfinders, uh, the uh, development that they are in the process of moving forward, which is Southeast Street School and the Belchertown Road. And um, we had uh, met with them just to get some information regarding um, their community information session. It is going to be on Thursday, March 7th at 6 p.m. virtual. It's going to be a virtual meeting. And what they're hoping to do is uh, have an information session where they will give the community as much information in terms of progress as well as the next sort of steps and timelines with those steps. Um, they're actually hoping to do a summer in-person site tour, which I think would be very beneficial. Um, they are absolutely interested in hearing uh, comments, feedback, any questions people may have, concerns they have. And um, they will be leading uh, that information session and we hope everybody will attend. Uh, and Carol and I will be asked to do um, a few brief comments. Of course, we're an absolute support of this. We're so excited about this moving forward. So uh, we will definitely be there on March 7th, but I invite everybody else to also be there March 7th. We will be getting uh, a flyer. Um, there actually will, we will be distributing it virtually our, uh, um, through our own um, links and in, in our connections, and we hope everybody else will as well. And they will also be flying um, the community uh, that's abutting the project, um, just to make sure as many people as possible know about this and have an opportunity to join. Um, go ahead, Grover. Did you state a time? So could you repeat it? Because I didn't. Sure, 6 p.m. They're hoping to have it at 6 p.m. Uh, virtually, and uh, we'll get out information as soon as we have it through, you know, through our own connections. But they will also be doing the same um, and try to get as many people as possible to come to that meeting. And it really is an information meeting. Uh, it's their information meeting. And I think uh, they, they have some really good progress and, um, you know, timelines that they're going to do the next steps that I think it's really important for people to know about, including uh, getting in front of the zoning board. So um, we're very, very excited. And they actually, um, the last time they came, they presented their, uh, again, their design, their pro uh, the, the development, the progress, and they actually were able to show that they we're going to create more units than we had expected that we had actually put in for in the RFR. So um, it's, it'll be a great opportunity for people just to see how far they've gone, um, what are the next steps, um, how they're going to engage the community and in input, um, how willing they are and interested they are in hearing community input. And I think, Rover, you mentioned um, the concern that might be um, that, you know, there's a project going across the street and then this project at the same time, so traffic flow, et cetera. And so um, it'll be really important for community members um, to, to hear what the plans are and, and how they can uh, resolve some of the questions they may have. 
Okay, so I don't see any other hands up. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn this over to Carol. Is Allegra raising her hand or just waving? I'm trying to, and then I also couldn't figure out where my mute button went. So I apologize for that. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Sorry, I didn't see you. You were on my screen. I have three people only. Um, go ahead, Allegra. Sorry about um, that. I was just wondering if the superintendent newsletter might be a place to advertise that as well because of the close proximity with the school um, and families who might be either living nearby already or interested in living nearby. I think that's a great comment. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Paul, oh, Nate's here. If Nate maybe could speak to, we. Uh, I know when we did our um, community listening session, we, I think it was Jennifer Moyston or maybe Liz Haygood um, who actually connected with the superintendent newsletter. So I wonder if we have a, um, a connection that that could happen. Uh, sure. Yeah. I'll just say yes. <clears throat> no, we can, um, you know, I can work with Jennifer again. We, it's usually through email. It can be, you know, an electronic newsletter. Um, sorry, I was having an update going right now. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I, that can be possible. I mean, Wayfinders is also going to put signs out on the proper property, temporary signs along the street. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll advertise it through the community calendar and online calendars, and we can try to get something uh, through the schools as well. Yeah, I actually think uh, the schools is really, really important because, um, you know, families with children, they're probably going to be the most concerned about the traffic flow and what's happening. So um, I think it'd be really important. And I know just right now, um, you know, I can I can walk past something that's stapled up there, but I won't stop and look. So email electronic is generally like gets people's attention. So thank you, Nate. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else that I'm not seeing? Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Carol. Okay. Thank you, Erica. I am going to probably just, so the first thing we're going to do is we have a couple of town updates here. I'm hoping that I thought Dave was going to talk about the volunteer VFW work group development or however that's going on, but maybe it's Nate. Hopefully. Can you give us an update on all of that? Nate? Sure. Yeah. I, I think I'll say hi to everyone. I'm Nate. I know I haven't met some of you yet, new to the trust members. Um, yeah, the town purchased the, uh, it's 457 Main Street, the former VFW. And the purpose is to create a, you know, a shelter and, and supportive housing. And so uh, we're finishing up or, you know, getting ready to, um, this, the building will be demolished. So that's something that would be happening. Um, we're also looking at hiring an architect or a consultant to, lead a series of workshops to come up with kind of programming ideas and concept designs for the site. And the hope would be that, you know, probably in March, someone would be uh, selected and then there would be, you know, kind of like stakeholder meetings or meetings, the trust would be involved. Um, and so that's where we are. I think the idea would be, um, you know, by July, you know, three months of that work. So March, April, May, um, but by July one, say to have, you know, concept designs and kind of an outline of what we what we think would be on the um, on the site, you know, kind of gross square feet, for instance, needed for the shelter or kind of what does it look like if it, you know, with parking and a site design and would help guide the town. Uh, kind of the next steps then would be, you know, what kind of request for proposal or, you know, procurement uh, does it look like in terms of actually developing the site, you know, kind of, you know, um, so it's, you know, the trust in, did something similar for the E Street School. You know, we had um, uh, Kuhn Riddle did some, you know, concepts and a little report. And so, you know, to me, it's something similar to that, uh, but focusing on that site. And so hopefully that'll get started in March. Um, this just popped into my head, but it makes me have another question about it. I, ve I sort of recall... Early on, when we were talking about this, people were talking about maybe doing some kind of a field trip to a place that I won't remember the name of that's down on the south coast somewhere, I think, that has a really good supportive housing kind of thing that it's doing. And we, I think, had talked about maybe having some people be able to go down there and just tour that and see what it's like as part of this process 
and I see Paul's hand up, so maybe there's an answer, but I, I'm hoping some of us can get to go with all that if it happens, Paul. Yeah, so that's in Quincy. It's called Father Bills, and it's a real model for what we want to do here. Um, and we're looking at, I know Dave and maybe Nate are working on a date. They've had conversations with them about having visitors. They're very open to that and welcoming of that. It's just a matter of getting a vehicle that we can, a, a, a van or something that people can go in and, and go visit. So I'm not sure who would be going, but I know that that's in the works. Great. Thank you. That seems like an important part of the works. And I'm I'm hoping that there's going to be like, I don't know, some of the people who are doing the supportive housing, maybe some Craig's Doors people or and maybe some of us and whoever else. I don't know. Anyway, hopefully we'll find out about it when it's happening. Right, Paul? Even if we can't go, we'll know about it. Fantastic. OK, so Nate, do you have any of the other thing I have on my list, which will get to is there's a new housing production plan RFP thing being developed. We have in our packet uh, a first run draft of that. But before we go there, is there any other kinds of town updates, Nate or Paul, that you are interested in giving us? I mean, I, you mentioned Wayfinders, and I think, I don't, I, Eric, I was a few minutes late, but you know they're hoping to start their comprehensive permit application process uh, this month, so there's a um, an initial phase where they um, submit a project eligibility letter to the town and state or the subsidizing agency, and the town would have a thirty comment thirty day comment period, and really that's the first phase to say that the project is generally feasible, financially feasible, the site's developable, and um, so they're hoping to submit that, and then the state will review it and say you know everything looks good. Uh, we you know usually we will put up a project web page and have comments and everything submitted along with that. And so, you know, kind of the public meeting that they're planning is will coincide with this. And it could be then that it takes the state, you know, a number of months to review the project. And so even after this initial phase, it might take a few months to say that it looks good and then they have to then prepare their comprehensive permit. But, you know, they're hoping to be in permitting in the fall by August and be, you know, through permitting by the end of the year to apply for funding uh, early next year. So they'll actually apply, hopefully get preliminary funding rounds in October, knowing that permitting will be done this calendar year. So, you know, it's pretty exciting. I mean, it's still a ways away before anything, but, you know, it's two sites. Uh, the ZBA is just finishing up Ball Lane. So hopefully they're well rehearsed when this one comes through. And, uh, you know, I think we have had a great team there and the town attorney is really helpful. So, you know, I think it's a matter of going through that process. Uh, but, you know, it'll be a number of meetings. There's probably a lot to talk about. Um, but I think just getting getting this permitting starting is started is really great. So is there any place in the this early part of the process, like between now and your estimated October or something, where support from us would be helpful to the process? I mean, during the 30-day comment period, if the trust, you know, if it aligns with a meeting, could review what was submitted, it'll be public. And, you know, the trust could vote to have, you know, the chairs, co-chairs write a memo uh, to the town and the state saying that it's, you know, it's supported. And then I think once it comes back through um, permitting, the plan is to maybe have some more public meetings about it. And I think the trust could then pick that up again, too, um, and just, you know, even have it as an agenda item, talk about it, see if there's any ways, um, if there's any concerns. I mean, it's been pretty quiet. I know some of the director butters. I've actually um, written letters in support of it um, to go That's to the great. initial phase, but I mean, there's not, you know, you never know what'll come. So I think, you know, some of it could be how, what, what we see what happens and how the trust might need to respond, right? If there needs to be some more education about a piece of it, then I think that's a good role for the trust. Okay. Well, I was, um, if either you or Greg could manage to make sure to let us, the trust members know when one of those opportunities happens so that we don't, or maybe it's just me being bad at keeping track of things, but often it feels to me personally, at least like, oh, I should have done that, but I didn't know about it yet. So whatever way that you can do to keep us all informed would be greatly helpful. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, any, any other town thing before we look at this um, housing production plan thing? I don't think so necessarily. 
Okay, that's fine. So well, I guess uh, I guess sorry, ahead. just quickly sorry to backtrack. You know, the planning board has been discussing an overlay district on University Drive between Amity Street and Route Nine, <clears throat> and uh, you know I've been working with that. Uh, you know, looking for infill development, bigger buildings, mixed use apartments. Uh, and it's generating some discussion about whether or not, you know, the town needs more housing there and if it's all students and what happens and should it just be for industry. And, you know, I think the planning board has been, a, you know, had a deliberate process. Uh, you know, the hope would be later this month or early next month to have kind of a draft of what that might look like in terms of goals and purpose and and things. And so, you know, I do think that section of University Drive is is an opportunity for newer development, infill development, and it's an overlay zone. And so it wouldn't, you know, the base zoning and what's allowed there is still allowed, but then the overlay would allow, you know, additional things if it complied with certain standards and conditions. So it may be that the trust, you know, uh, we can bring this to the trust as well as it gets a little further along. Great. Thank you. That sounds good. Um. So I don't know who got a chance to look at it, but Greg sent us out, I guess it's his draft of because it's time for the town to have a new housing production plan. So an RFP will go out requesting to find a consultant to do that. And it is a project that is kind of in some ways like our planning process, although it's bigger because it's not only about affordable housing, it's about a housing production plan of whatever kinds of housing the town thinks that it wants to have. However, it feels like our opportunity to kind of at least look through uh, this draft in process. This is like, I think, an early attempt uh, at what the housing production plan requests for proposals or RFQ, whatever. Anyway, request to have a consultant to create this plan is going to go out so I'm wondering if people had a chance, did people get a chance to read it, first of all, and are there comments or questions or thoughts? Gaston. I guess I, I wonder if you could just, um, Nate, maybe give us a an overview of where this fits in relation to the uh, town's general strategy that is um, later in our packet, the comprehensive housing policy what's what these kinds of plans have done in the past and i guess the the number the levers that are available to to move through this plan sure yeah i think the um you know the the current housing production plan it's expired it was done in 2013 and you know a housing production plan is something that uh the state is a state program and so it, it's a pretty formulaic process to develop housing needs it focuses on affordable housing and then the idea would be communities would complete a housing production plan submit it to the state and get the the plan approved and the idea would be that if you then meet production goals which is usually set at a half of one percent of um your number of housing units so if you know you know in Amherst, say it's 48 housing units permitted affordable units permitted in a calendar year if you work towards the goal of the affordable housing plan then you could um safely deny a comprehensive permit in your town and so the i think the idea was originally to have towns at least do a housing study to determine what are the needs what are the gaps and do an assessment and then work towards that so you know um if a, if a developer came in and proposed something that was really not consistent with those needs, you could have something to deny it. I think, you know, for Amherst right now, to me, the idea of this housing production plan is to focus on affordable housing, but really it's, you know, I don't think that we, we've we met the need. And so using it is helpful because if we have a housing production plan, it does help us with grant applications and other funding applications. It shows the state, you know, we're following what they'd like to see and that we're serious about it. So, you know, some communities might just do a, maybe like a housing study but then it doesn't really qualify, right? It doesn't have some of those, the maybe the analysis that's necessary. And so, you know, what Greg and I have talked about is we'll, we want a housing production plan, but we can go beyond that. So if there's, in my mind, if there's any, you know, you, you know, things that we want them to focus on in Amherst, whether it's the student housing or certain income levels, you know, that's where we could put it in this scope of services. Um, so it's not just looking at, you know, capital A affordable, maybe it's different types of housing or demographic information. You know, my thought is this is the one time we'll kind of have, 
you know, a current housing plan that could be used for the next five to eight years. And so uh, the city of Springfield is doing something similar. I guess they're going through and they're going to um, actually, we had a comprehensive housing market study that was done following the um, housing production plan. The market study was done in 2015 and it looked at kind of just general market rate housing and, you know, segments of population. And it was, you know, could have been both used by realtors and others. And it was, you know, kind of a broad document. And Springfield is going to do something similar. They're going to kind of take a housing production plan model and then also have it be a bigger report because, you know, it's something that then gets folded into policies or the master plan. And so, you know, for Amherst, it's, we have, you know, we have a master plan uh, that's now, um, you know, about 14 years old. And then, you know, the housing production plan, say the transportation plan, you know, are all part of that, right? They get in incorporated into the master plan. So the master plan has bigger uh, goals and visions. We have the comprehensive housing policy. And so to me, the housing production plan then will help identify needs and hopefully strategies and action steps that can be taken. And it's, you know, the trust is looking at doing an action plan and, you know, that brings it down, say, even smaller, narrower in scope. So what is something that the trust can implement? Uh, in one to two years or up to five years. And the housing production plan will say, okay, well, here's gaps and needs. And then it can help the trust and the town prioritize. Okay, if we have funding, what do we do? Is it senior housing? Is it, you know, 30% AMI? And, you know, right now we've been waiting for the 2020 census data to be out. And I, I think it is, it, it's not, it's, you know, they've collected it differently than the previous years. And so, uh, you know, we're hoping that, given other data sources, we can have a really nice report that, you know, it might be a little detailed and take a long time to read, but hopefully it has all the information in there that we can refer to it. And so, you know, I think, I think that's where it is. Like, I just, I see it as a, a really useful document for the town that we can refer to and use. Thank you. Grover. Yeah, Nate, my question is how, um, I see here that it says uh, a, a multiple times in different ways, basically. One part of it is anticipating or estimating future growth and future needs. And I'm curious how that is determined and, and who has a say in that. And I say that because like in hearing UMass talk about their house, their predictive future enrollment that that had within a certain set of assumptions that um, uh, we might not all agree on. I didn't agree with. And um, also I'm thinking, for example, like we know that senior housing is gonna keep being uh, a need as our population and average ages and student population is likely to be a need, but also um, I think it's important to factor in increased housing for a climate migrants, which both domestically as as more people continue to move here as climate becomes unlivable in other places um, in the from the US, but also from abroad. And so like it's a it's in some ways like a decision making question of if we if we hire, you know, whoever's selected to create the plan ultimately, where is the input happening and, and what is the decision making process for what future needs are considered and how that decision making happens. Yeah, I mean, I think they'd probably, you know, use census data. We can point them to like Donahue Institute reports or other benchmark uh, and studies. And so, and it could be that if we have other ideas, like you just mentioned, we could ask them to look into it. Uh, you know, and I think some of it would also be kind of like what the comprehensive housing market study from 2015 said, is that actually if there was more housing opportunity for different types, they would move to Amherst. So it's not also about what what who's here because of what's here, but it's like, well, who's not here because it's not built. And so, um, you know, and it's, that's hard to get at, but I think we could ask them to look at, you know, regional data as well, uh, maybe outside, you know, New England and, and, you know, and so some of it's just trends, general trends, but it could just be, okay, what's the next five or 10 years really, they might just project out 10 years. And yeah, I, I think that's a good question. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it, some of it is a bit of a guess, but some of it would be, okay, well, uh, you know, it's not a build out. It's not looking at our zoning and saying, well, the town can support X number of units and per se. That's a kind of a more detailed thing. But, you know, looking at, you know, general population and demographic trends. I've got three hands. Uh, Erica. 
<clears throat> so in, in reading our own trust mission, uh, the mission says that the trust is an instrument of the town government uh, in, is supposed to promote the town's affordable housing priorities as determined through the most recent town housing plan. That plan is changing. We're moving into an action planning process. Can you talk a little bit about how you're going to ensure that what we're doing is supported by this plan? Uh, where are we going to come in with this? Because uh, it seems like our mission is really to work with you around the housing um, production plan. Yeah, I mean, last time the plan was produced, the trust was, you know, worked really closely with the consultant. And so, you know, the trust was almost like a working group of the consultant team and reviewed drafts and talked about goals and priorities. And so I envisioned a similar process. The, uh, you know, the, this, the procurement process, a request for quotes would be seeking three, at least three quotes. And, you know, we have minimum qualifications in there. Uh, but it could be that if this is something that, if we like the document, it could be issued and someone could be on board, you know, in six to seven weeks. And so the the process would align what was happening with Shelley. So, you know, I see them as, you know, kind of simultaneous tracks that can inform each other. And then, you know, it could be that maybe the, the housing production plan typically takes a little bit longer. So maybe that the action plan of the trust needs to get modified at the end of the year. If, you know, if something um really rises up in that plan that wasn't foreseen so i don't you know i don't they're not mutually exclusive i think that they can help each other and um you know so I, that's kind of how i see it working is you know two parallel tracks that can inform each other uh guess on uh, thanks so i guess um my, my feedback or, or curiosity nate would be about highlighting two two things one would be better understanding of the dynamic of uh, the expanding market for more student oriented or call it luxury oriented housing and making sense of the dynamics of that in relation to the other kind of housing the town might get. And I, I would think that the way to do that is for this uh, consultant to assess other uh, university towns and give us some comparative analysis. So th I guess that would be one one piece that I would be really curious about. The, the other piece is expressing a, a policy preference. And I don't know if we're in a position to do that, but my my personal, uh, I guess, idea is that uh, ex expressing a policy to create housing for children, school-aged children, would be very positive for the town by increasing uh, state funding for the schools. Um, I'm going to call on Greg, but first thing I say, I think that part of what we're doing here, besides asking Nate to answer lots of questions, is looking for the things that we would maybe like to see this proposal incorporate, which is what we've been doing. And so that's kind of, I guess, feedback for Greg and for whoever, whoever else is involved in the creation of this. And so, Greg. Thanks, Carol. Um, just going in reverse order a little bit. So Gaston's um, suggestion of looking at other university towns is a kind of a great example of sort of what we can insert into this um, RFQ, which in turn will hopefully result in the eventual product containing stuff like that. Um, so thank you for, the, for that um, idea, you know, and, and the policy idea. Um, and Gro I just wanted to speak to Grover's um, inquiry around like projections. And I, I, had, I had similar sort of questions because it's kind of a chicken or the egg question in a way, but I, the thing, having looked at a fair number of these plans, you know, both our, our, our rather aged one and other others more recent from around the state, um, you know, and, and also just knowing the basics about what our census data is, our plan will absolutely show acute need, right? Like there's no way to slice the census data without demonstrating both existing cost burden households, renter and owner, and an unmet need for, you know, for deeply affordable and all kinds of affordable stuff. So, you know, how they go about, you know, I think there are creative places to look, you know, and I think looking at projections, you know, that that might be outside of census data could be useful looking at different populations. I mean, I think that's an area where the state regs don't um, necessarily push really hard in my mind, but for, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see like, like the, <clears throat> the state regs don't name immigrants at all, but we could say, and I can think I maybe not in the draft you all have, but in a more recent one, I think I added, you know, you know, 
how are we serving immigrants through our housing channel? You know, as as example of one demographic, you know, that um, that we could address in this plan. So, but it will show need for sure. Um, do I see any other hands? I was going to just mention quickly. I'm taking some notes. The planning board. A member of the planning board has reached out to um, about 15 college communities across the country, and he, he narrowed it down based on population, certain demographics, you know, household, um, saw, you know, number of households or housing units, uh, to try to get an idea of how they manage student housing off campus. And so, I think Greg, I just was going to say that I think you know those are comparable communities. The planning boards looked at those, and I think we could reference those and provide that. Uh, as part of the scope of work, just so that they're not, you know, if, if we, if the planning board thought they were good and, you know, we can um, provide them, it, you know, we don't have to then try to think like, oh, which, which university town or which place it's like, okay, these are the ones that have similar population and, you know, maybe, you know, geographic size and other things, and that could be appropriate. So I have two hands and I, I actually have two specific things that I want to say, and then I will go to the two hands. The specific things I want to request are in the part where it's talking about work sessions and staff meetings. It has all bunch of people that are supposed to meet. The consultant will conduct a work session with conservation, various stakeholders. I would like to see the trust included in that list of people that they're supposed to work with. Um, and the other thing I would like to see is on where it says the minimum consultant criteria some kind of affordable housing development experience or affordable housing experience of some sort should be in that list of things that would be good for the consultant to have. Um, so those are my two specific requests. And now I have, we'll go to Grover and I think John Hornick has his hand up. So Grover, go ahead. Uh, yeah, mine is a, a quick comment or reflection, which is like, I appreciate uh, putting in there to compare Amherst to other college towns, but at the same time, and this is kind of getting to my original point, I don't know another college town in the United States that were like, yeah, they're nailing it. They really have this affordable housing thing down. For in the community, every college town I've lived in has had significant stress. So um, just thinking about it's, comparing is fine. And also how are we setting our making sure our plan sets us up for success rather than replicating unsuccess other places. Very good. Uh, John Hornick, can, Greg, can you allow John to speak? Thank you, Carol. Um, <clears throat> I think it would be useful for people to look at uh, the last housing production plan, not so much because it was a terrific plan, although it did have its strengths as well as its weaknesses. I don't think you have to look at all of the plan, but probably the thing to focus on would be the executive summary, which, as I recall, was four or five pages. Um, and, you know, that's really what people are going to focus on at the end of the day, very few people are gonna read the entire plan. So think about that as something either that you want or you don't want. What are the things that you would like to see included for our own plan? And what would you not like to see included? I think that executive summary gives you some idea about how the needs assessment was conducted the last time how data was used, how specific populations were represented, all of those things that I know at least Grover and possibly others have expressed an interest in. The other thing I'll mention about the last housing production plan is that on the one hand, it wasn't terribly ambitious. I think it was 48 units a year for five years. Um, but whatever we actually came up with or whatever actually occurred was a lot less than was promised in the housing production plan. So you can put a tremendous amount of time and effort 
into doing something that's quite elaborate. But at the end of the day, one of the lessons I certainly learned myself was that there's no point in honestly getting over ambitious. You need to focus on what's likely going to be doable. And that's what needs to be represented in the town, in the plan, and particularly in the executive summary. So all that's important. Last time around, it had to be reviewed by the select board. We no longer have that form of government, but clearly it's something that would have to be reviewed by town council. And the important group there would be uh, the community group that we need to work with in order to make sure that this thing has a positive reception for town council. So based on prior experience, those are the things I would emphasize. Look at the old uh, executive summary. Think about specifically what you like, what you don't like, what you would get rid of, what you think is missing. And uh, uh, think about working with town council to make this thing a reality because without them, um, the state does not accept it. Thank you, John. Um, are there any other comments, questions, thoughts, anything anybody wants to say about this? We have now something else to look at from John. I think I think that the existing housing production plan is in the materials that Greg put together for us to look at in preparation for our uh, for our own planning. Is that right, Greg, or am I getting it wrong? Well, anyway, we can add it to that place if it's not there. You're correct, Carol. Okay. Uh, Rob. Um, I, I, I'm uh, interested in, in uh, who is who is commissioning the this plan and, and who is paying for it. Where's the where's the money? Yeah, the town had planning department had put in a capital request a few years ago. And then we have some additional capital funding. So it's the you know town's planning department that has the funding for it. Yeah, we've been waiting for the 2020 census data for a while. And then with staff changes, and, and then we knew we were going to get Greg we, on board. We waited for Greg to uh, help with that. So um, yeah, like I said, we hope to get it going kind of to parallel the action plan for the trust. Erica. Uh, I just wanted to add, um, I actually took a look at the South Hadley housing production plan. And I think what Nate said before, which is, um, you know, using the data, uh, really getting, you know, a current sense of the data um, to use as a guideline for making decisions is so important. Theirs was absolutely comprehensive and it included ADUs. It included anything you could think about in terms of developing housing and affordable housing. Um, so uh, if anyone has the time, you may want to take a look at it. But having that data for us, we're always asking about data. We're always asking about, you know, do we have the current data in order to make the most appropriate decisions? So um, that's going to be really, really important. And looking at all aspects of affordable housing and alternatives, I think is really important. Even, you know, tiny homes, um, just so we can make the decision in terms of, for us, where's the best place where we can push around affordable housing and make the biggest impact. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I think then we can move on to our next item, if nobody has anything else to say about this, which is our action planning, except that I see a hand again. Gaston, go ahead. I, I just wanted to ask uh, Nate and Greg, what is the time frame that you're looking for our kind of last round of feedback that you're able to incorporate? Does the strategic process that we've initiated give us that space, given the time frames you're you're aiming for? I mean, I, I guess I'll I can't I can let Greg answer, but I think if I'll, I'll answer a little bit. But if we have like you know two weeks to get comments. Um, I don't think that interrupts the process because, you know, we have to, you know, I, Greg and I still want to look at it. We have to, you know, get a few things um, worked, but I, I don't, you know, I think if we could receive comments back, 
then. Yeah, I mean, and and to be clear too, right now, you know, this is you know more of a a housing focus group, and so you know we were we decided it couldn't hurt to kind of throw this on the agenda tonight, so we did. Um, but this is just for the RFQ for the consultant where the really meaty feedback will come hopefully is once we actually have that consultant and we're doing those stakeholder meetings and we're, you know, and we're, you know, they're presenting, you know, you know, what they find when they delve into that actual data and so forth. And that's kind of when there's, you know, so right now we're kind of having the conversation before the conversation um, to some degree. Um, uh, but um, in the spirit of, you know, looping people in, you know, up front. But if I, I would say if, that, um, you know, this is a request for qualification. So, you know, with public procurement, we would take the lowest qualified response. And so as you're going through the document, I think the task and um, scope of services is important. And then, you know, Carol, you had also looked at maybe the minimum qualification. So, you know, the idea is that we'd want to, you know, as a as a public procurement process, anyone could submit or, uh, you know, a price proposal. But, you know, we'd want to at least make sure they have relevant experience. So if you, as you're reading this, if you think, wow, there's something that is missing that can be added. And so we can uh, identify consultants to send this to, but then really anyone can respond. And so, uh, you know, I was just looking at the calendar, for instance, if, you know, two weeks from now, if we could then, um, we receive comments back, we get that going. And then we still could probably have someone, um, you know, selected by the end of March if, you know, if everything works out in terms of timing. So I don't, I don't think it delays it much to have that, you know, those two weeks to have people review it again. So, but if you're saying two weeks, I'm noticing that that means that we are not going to have another trust meeting at which we can look at it again. So I think the thing is that if, if we have, we've said things now, Greg's taking notes, Nate is going to look at it all. If people think of other things, especially going and looking at the old housing production plan, like John just suggested we do, if people come up with other things that they think they would like to see included, we won't have a chance to talk about them, but I think it is acceptable for us to email them, not to each other, but to Nate and Greg. And then we haven't done any open meeting mess, I don't think. We just send suggestions uh, from each of us as we come up with them to Nate and Greg and Paul will correct me if I'm wrong about that, I'm sure. So, but I think I got a thumbs up. So we have, so figure that please look at the old production plan and anything else you wanna think about in the next two weeks, get any comments directly to Nate and Greg and they will proceed with getting the RFQ out. Okay, and I see that Shelly has joined us to welcome Shelly. I hope that you're healthy again and your kids are healthy and everybody's back in good shape. Yes, and uh, <clears throat> so um, Shelly wanted to be here to at least hear what in the world it is that we do as we go through. We had hoped that right now what we would be doing would be talking about follow up from our, from our, uh, in-person thing. We haven't had it yet, so this is kind of a chance to preview it a little bit. What we thought we would do, first of all, is to say it has been rescheduled to February 29th from 5 to 7. It will is again planned to be in the town room at Town Hall, and I believe that I'm from our, I think everybody could come, so I think that we're really happy about that and we will go through what we were going to go through then. The one thing that we thought we would do now, it was gonna be, still is probably the first thing that we'll do with the in-person part, but we wanted to spend a little while having a chance to look at mainly the document that was that is in the materials that Greg put on the website for us to look at, the one that's called progress. It's taking our old strategic plan. It starts out with the list of the goals at, top, at the top and looks through what are the things that we've done and what are the things that we still need to do. And um, we can, we have an option here. We can, we have slides of it. If we want to, we can look at all of it in detail. If that's what people think they would like to do. If people have already already looked at it and this will be boring and stupid and a waste of time, then let's not do that. But let's see if there are any questions or comments that people have 
I'm we're kind of open to doing a whatever way works for everybody. So if somebody has an opinion here, uh, please let me know. And if there are no opinions, and I'll start by asking if first, let me have, can we have a show of hands? Have people read this thing? Have people looked at it? And so actually we know something about what we're talking about here. Okay, that's a, that's a good beginning. Uh, um, are there questions or comments from what you remember? Erica. I just wanted to add, <clears throat> one of the reasons we did this is because we thought it was really important for all of us to be on the same page in terms of, you know, what were the goals uh, from, you know, 2018 to 2022 and what was achieved. And um, what I'd like to say, too, is, is that uh, in the beginning, there were only six goals. We actually added the seventh goal. Um, and uh, I think Carol actually even crosswalked our goals with the comprehensive housing policy. And you can see that there are a lot of them that actually support each other. Um, but we really thought it was important before we start talking about where we want to go is to just see what we've actually been able to achieve. And for the areas that we have not yet achieved, do we want to continue those particular areas or do we want to drop them? So it's just really an opportunity just to have a document that we can use as a platform, as a trajectory for our next steps. Well, this could maybe be a really quick conversation if nobody has anything to say. Allegra. Um, I really appreciated this document. Um, I like bullet points. It makes my brain focus better. Um, but I, A, it showed me that we've actually kind of done a lot, which was nice to see, but also that there is still a lot to be done. Um, and I think that when we talk more about where we want to go moving forward, I'd be interested, especially in some of the areas that don't have any yet to be accomplished listed, because I think there's still work that we could do in those areas. Um, but I, I did like how it condensed a lot of information into a small number of pages it was accessible for me thank you so the ones that you're talking about which don't have anything yet to be accomplished are two and five maybe yes two is support home ownership homelessness prevention initiatives and expand availability of direct housing assistance we don't have anything there we said we didn't do but that doesn't mean it's all done, of course. Correct. <laughs> and I, I guess I guess I'm saying I or I'm thinking about just because we've checked all these boxes and there's nothing left and yet to be accomplished, does that mean that we're done with that category, or does that mean there's still things that we can continue to do in those areas? Um, because I'm sure I, there's I'm sure there's still things we continue can continue to do. Uh, Gaston. I guess I could use a little bit of um, help with the analysis that that went from the left to the right column. I'm I'm looking at the number one actively foster development, and uh, on the yet to be accomplished, it's review all affordable housing development proposals, and I'm not seeing that uh, in, in those words on the left column. And so I'm, I I can see that there's analysis that that went on here that I I don't fully understand and. And so it would be helpful maybe to get a little uh, walking through how um, you you assess the um, what was yet to be accomplished from from the the left column. Absolutely. Um, so in, in taking, order, let me just in <laughs> order to do that, would it be helpful to have the thing on the screen to look at? Because we can do that. There's no reason not to, other than let's do it. Well, you can do it, but I think, you know, what's the, the document that um, I worked off of was the Housing Trust Strategic Plan. So in looking at each of the goals, um, there were objectives under each of the goals. And so looking at the objectives, um, and again, I have only been on the Housing Trust since 2019. Um, so this was actually put together in 2018. So what happened before 20, um, 
19, uh, I was, uh, I think um, Greg and, and Nate were, were going to try to help to make sure that this was accurate. We actually found one area where it was not, uh, what we've stated is not accurate and which we'll correct. Um, so going through the, um, the plan and looking at each of the objectives, what was listed in each of the object objectives. And so when looking at each of the ex objectives, I try to think of the things that we've actually done to meet those objectives. Uh, and so uh, just in terms of the period from 2019 to, uh, to the time that, you know, I've been on the trust. So for, ex for example, ac actively fostering development. Um, so, you know, something that's pretty clear, providing funding. So these are the specific actions that you know I knew of or I was involved with that would then support this actively fostering development. Um, and then looking what is in the plan that was, there's nothing here that shows that we've done it. So then I put it into the yet to be accomplished column. Um, so this is a working document. If someone has read the plan and disagrees, absolutely, let's, let's you know, fix it. It wasn't really, it's meant to give us an insight of how much we've accomplished in what areas in the document that was stated as an objective or as a, uh, yeah, as an objective under a goal that I did not see accomplished just to, for us to think about developing our future goals and our future priorities. Um, just because there might've been lots of things accomplished doesn't mean that we don't want this as a goal. Actively fostering development is something that I'm sure we want as a goal, but then we have to think of very, very specific actions uh, that are measurable and um, that we can actually you know, accomplish that are, that are reasonable. So it's just you know, really analysis from the document, nothing else. Got it, thank you. So the, the um... I've got to be looking at the document to really uh, see what you did, but now I understand much better. Thank you, Erica. Sure. And oh. again, um, some of the, uh, sorry, Carol, some of the things that were accomplished are not in that document. One of the things that this document stated was that we were supposed to um, review this. So there was one review where we actually looked at it and, and um, stated what the progress was, but after that, it didn't happen. So I think, you know, one of the things that we have to be very clear about in our action plan, let's put in timelines for review and for documenting and archiving what we've accomplished under the objectives, because that way the next group can use that as a tra trajectory for moving forward. That, that wasn't, it was only done once while I, I've been on the trust. <clears throat> Also, I'm guessing that when we do the process that we're going to do with Shelley, this might be shorter. What we come out with might be shorter because maybe if we're trying to find, I mean, maybe a context like this that it will be in, but it may be that we find fewer things that we're really going to try to accomplish in the next couple of years and have a better idea what they are. Shelley, if I'm putting some bad words in your mouth, please correct me. <laughs> okay um well is there any any other commentary hopefully people have read this and looked at the strategic plan also and so we'll be ready to hit the ground running on the on the 29th grover well one question that reviewing this with all of you raises for me is is to what extent or what level of detail do we need to lay out the like some of these um like in the yet to be accomplished some of the some of the things are actually big pieces of work that are not just one thing like develop strategies for active public engagement such as media and advocacy toolkits which is which like requires some questions about staffing or responsibility and where things are held or what our stances are you know like there's a as a person who for whom this is my job to do those things like it's it's a lot of steps into that step so I'm just curious of like as we're creating goals for the next time is it like we want to promote outreach and education and one of those things we want to do is create media and advocacy toolkits then do we need to ensure that there's staff capacity to manage documents in the staff position or right like do you see what i'm saying those kinds of questions that enable that or do we just put up 
the end goal we want and and hope the other pieces fall into place. <laughs> I don't know. This The way you ask the question kind of implies an answer. I mean, I hope that we get specific enough so that we do know something about what we're trying to do. I I mean, I think that's the goal and part of what we've part of what we're hoping to gain from do, going through this process with the help of MHP and Shelley is to have things that are, what, what were her words, were uh, measurable and, and specific enough so that we can tell if we did it or not, for instance. So I, I think that's in there. Uh, Shelley, I'm going to let you talk before Nate since your hand's up. Just to respond to that, part of what we're going to do is not only the goals, but also strategies under each of the goals to help you dig into what what it, what are the specific ways that you're going to try to reach the goals. So I think that Grover, it gets to that question that if this becomes a priority, then we need to come up with what are the different strategies that we'll need in order for you to reasonably try to accomplish that goal. Thank you. Nate. Thanks. Yeah, I, I was going to mention, um, I mean, Gro Grover, it's a great segue. I was going to say that if you know if you're looking at the document and as we're working through the the next steps with Shelley, I mean some of the ideas would be there could be subcommittees of the trust that take on a larger responsibility. And so, you know, it is a lot say for just one staff person or Greg or something to do all of this. And you know, it happens you know kind of organically with staff. So you know, Dave Zomack helps a lot, or Rob Mora, or you know, the planning director. And so there's a lot of people that are involved in this. And some of it might be well. You know, maybe some of it's how does that how does that get better coordinated, um, and also maybe there's a subcommittee of the trust if there is, you know, certain policies that need to be looked into. Do two or three members really focus on that for three months or six months? And because because you know there's so many pieces of it, but I think you know we had uh, subcommittees of the trust a few years ago, and it'd be nice to have one or two if through this process we identify some high priorities because it can it can really help further it. You know, could you could be meeting once or twice a month, it's outside of regular meetings, you report back. And so it helps, you know, keep things moving along in a, in a timely manner. So I, you know, I just think that's something to consider, you know, you know, how do we take ownership of some of those? And maybe, you know, it can't be 10 goals, maybe it's three, and it's, we can narrow it down. And it's really, it's really concise and helpful. Um, but I just, you know, I put that out there, and you know, we're willing to help facilitate, um, you know, subcommittee meetings, you know, Greg and I can work with subcommittees. So we had, I'm going to call on Corinne in a second, but I want to say that we had a, a small little subcommittee that was um, Erica and Grover and I that came, that worked to begin to start the strategic planning process. And I expect that we may continue to want to have that group working on the strategic, the, the planning process that we're going through as a subcommittee as we go through the process with perhaps someone else joining. I don't know, but I, I think that that's, Kind of the first one that we were are most likely to continue to need, uh, Corinne. Um, in terms of the section that talks about like collaboration, I'm seeing a lot of like housing organizations, and I wonder in terms of thinking through like projected needs and general needs that we know of already getting creative about the organizations we collaborate with. They're not just specifically housing, but who can we get creative with in terms of, you know, getting more information outside of someone who's specific housing? And I, I wouldn't be able to go through and name specific names now, but I something to think about um, in terms of those collaborations. Great point. Thank you. Erica. So when we uh, did review the uh, strategic plan and we did make the revision by adding um, goal number seven, we actually added a section on subcommittees. And I think, you know, the comments that are made just right now is really important because um, there are hopefully nine of us soon. And, um, you know, to explore, let's say, um, community outreach, community engagement, that, that you know, as Grover said, that's huge. That is really huge. Or, um, you know, uh, keeping affordable housing in the media every week, you know, Amherst Bulletin, The Reminder, whatever else, um, that is huge. Uh, in terms of the work or, you know, being um, connected to other groups, be it housing or be it, um, you know, different supportive services that are wraparound services that can impact stability in housing. Um, you know, we try to 
to be on on uh, lists, group lists, uh, and be connected with other groups, but it, it takes a lot of time. If there were nine of us who each one of us would do something, or even like, you know, in planning, the planning board, um, looking at overlays, if we had each one of us, you know, be involved in, you know, a particular uh, objective that we decided upon, I think we can get more done, but, you know, it's really a commitment on all of us to think, you know, can we make that further commitment to get some things done? And so I think, you know, in terms of the action planning, there is what can we do when we have, you know, a trust that meets once a month, or what can we do if we have a trust that has subcommittees and can, you know, these are the focus of the subcommittees. And so um, I think we have to be very realistic about how much how many resources we have and how much time as a resource we can commit and be re very realistic about that as we do our action planning. So we don't set ourselves up for being frustrated. Thank you. Any other comments about our strategic planning process, which will begin in earnest on the 29th? Uh, if not, then I think that we are running ahead of schedule, which is kind of nice. And, um, I will turn things back over to Erica. Thank you. Um, so I have added uh, on the agenda um, some of the legislative highlights from the Massachusetts Public Health Association uh, that I'm a member of, and maybe some of you are members of as well. Um, I actually did attend uh, the BU uh, first series on housing, health, and homelessness. And um, the Massachusetts Public Health Association was on and talked about their housing justice um, priorities. Uh, and so I just wanted to talk about two there. I know there are four there, but if you go into their website, you'll see the whole, um, the priorities that they have. Um, there, you know, there are four here listed, but I only want to talk about two. And I think the rest, you can take a look at yourself. The reason why I wanted to talk about the first one, the Rent Control Enabling Act, um, is because during our listening session, uh, both uh, written submissions, as well as people who were, uh, who attended that meeting, the one of the areas that I heard often talked about is rent control. And so it seems that this is a really, really important area that we can have an impact on that, uh, especially in terms of the residents, you know, in our communities, as well as across um, Massachusetts. And I think if you were to, each of these uh, in terms of the Massachusetts Public Health Association website, they have fact sheets that you can look at. They're very simplistic, one page, um, and it really can give you the highlights. But I, I wanted to clarify because when people think about rent control, there are often a lot of issues that come up for people. Um, so it's both in the House and the Senate. Um, our representatives, um, uh, Rogers, Mon Montiano, and Senator, um, I can't even read my handwriting, Jellen, and I think it's Gurney, uh, are the senators who are, are supporting it. Um, what this does is it limits rent increases to the rate of inflation with a cap of 5%. It um, bans no-fault evictions. It clarifies both for tenants and landlords what qualifies as legal, legal reasons for eviction. So clarity both for tenants and for owners. It exempts owner-occupied buildings with four or less uh, units. And it also exempts new construction for five years. So it gives people who are um, developing um, um, apartments, it gives them a five-year period to understand what's going to be required. So I think that is one of the bills that I think really responds to some of the comments uh, or many of the comments made um, at the listening session. So I thought that was really important to share um, with the group. The second one that I thought was really important to share as well is the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, um, which is being sponsored by Representative Livingston and Consals Consalvo, and then Senator Jellin. Um, and municipalities have to actually opt into that. Uh, and what it does is for multifamily properties, when owners decide that they're going to sell that property, they have to notify the tenants and the municipality when they're about to sell. Um, the tenants can actually form a, a tenant association, um, and it has to be at least 51% uh, of the units in terms of that tenant association. And they can also then designate their rights to a nonprofit or local housing authority to then re represent them. And so what it uh, gives them is the right of first offer. And if the owner actually signs an agreement with a third party, the tenant association, if they can meet that offer, they have the right for the first offer. And if they can't meet that within a certain time period, then the owner has the right to then sell to the third party. So I thought both of these were 
two bills that really sort of fit into um, our goals and, and um, our mission in terms of um, more control by tenants and um, communities of being able to ensure that people have the ability to um, have control over their um, living situation and also how much they actually spend uh, on their uh, rent and on their housing. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those two. Um, in terms of the CHAPA priorities, they're very, very comprehensive and extensive. And there are many of the bills that we've talked about in the past that um, you've given Carol and myself uh, permission to support. Um, and it's very comprehensive in terms of, you know, the, the housing bill that we, we've supported, um, anything from support of housing the unhoused, affordable housing, preventing homelessness, and providing opportunities for becoming a homeowner. So um, I would definitely take a look at some of those bills. Um, you know, generally, Carol and I uh, come in front of you and ask you to give us permission to support those bills. Um, but these are two that I think are really, really important to support. And uh, I hope that um, you have had an opportunity to take a look at them. Um, and so I'll just open up for comments. Uh, Allegra, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to point out and that Somerville has actually also put forward a home rule petition for rent stabilization, um, which I imagine is kind of similar to the process Amherst took with putting forward the home rule petition on the transfer fees. Um, so just putting that out into the universe. <laughs> um, but again, I think it's great that we have a rundown of some of the bills that are out there. And there are some things that I know that we've supported as a trust, but I also hope that we can support individually as well. Thank you, Allegra. And uh, I'll look into it and then um, send the link to everyone so they can look at it. Paul? Yeah, so the town council has been working on legislation in this. And so I think it's really important for the trust to make sure you're coordinating and coalescing with town council, with the members of the town council um, we meet regularly with our state rep and state senator, and uh, one of their cautions is to, to us is that we don't speak with too many voices. Um, now, individually, people can ad, you know, advocate how they see fit, but the trust, I think, should be coalescing around what the council has agreed to. They've the council actually had its own legislation on some of these issues, so I think as long as the as long as the trust is alert to what the council's doing and and coordinating and like. More voices are always better, but make sure that we're saying the same thing. Because um, we had a long discussion about that, some of these things today with uh, our senator and state rep. Thank you, Paul. A point well taken. Um, we actually were contacted by the town council president asking Good. if we wanted a liaison again this year. Yeah. And both Carol and I absolutely said, absolutely, because we need to be on the same page and we need to be able to then support each other when we are uh, working on different things that also support affordable housing. So um, absolutely, we're hoping that we'll get a liaison Good. and we will keep each other informed. Carol? Well, that brings me to say that we, um, we, because I did it, just signed a sign-on letter in support of the bills going forth about the transfer fee. Um, we, I signed it because we have, we in our past have supported both the way that the town, the way that our counselors wrote it, just as a home rule petition, the way they wanted it, and we also have been in support of the one that people are pushing throughout the whole state to get it so that any town can do something similar. So we have actually signed on to a letter saying that we support that. Thank you, Carol. Um, which brings me to a, a, another announcement, which does have to do with the town council. So um, the finance, well, before I do that, are there any other comments regarding legislation or any other bills that we should be aware of? Okay, um, uh, we have heard that the finance committee is revising the policy for disposal of surplus town property. 
Um, and so um, since we did not have a conversation, we, we actually did have a conversation a while back, we, but we never sort of agreed uh, in terms of how we as the trust wanted to respond or if there was any action we wanted to take. I think there was some concern about um, first right of refusal. Um, so we never really moved forward with uh, any action. But since the finance committee is actually looking at the prior policy and revising it, both are on the website, the prior policy, as well as the current policy with the edits that the uh, finance committee members are um, making to that, um, I, as an independent resident, um, submitted my comments um, asking that uh, specific language around affordable housing be included. Um, and the reason I, I asked for that was is that even though right now the commitment of the town and town council to affordable housing is absolutely wonderful, but there's always change of leadership. And without um, putting that into a document, even though it's just a policy, but not putting it into a document, someone can you know, in the future, just ignore it. Uh, and so to please include language. Um, the other thing that is um, that I noted was different is, is that there was a, um, an advisory group that was in the past policy that doesn't seem to be, uh, probably is not going to be included in the future one, but if it is, that uh, to also include a trust member as part of that. So uh, I know Carol also uh, submitted her own comment as a resident of Amherst, um, but we thought it would be important for all of us to know that that uh, policy is being looked at and is being revised. Um, and uh, even though we've had such great uh, collaboration with town council and um, with the town regarding surplus property, um, it's just really important since there's such a lack of uh, there's such a scarcity of, of developable property in, in Amherst that to ensure that uh, consideration is being given to affordable housing is actually written in and not assume that people will think about that. Um, so I'm, I'll open up for comments or questions. Paul, you're off mute. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, no, it's, it's, I think that's the right thing for the trust to advocate for, and the, and the council should hear from you on that. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. Thank you, Paul. And um, I just want to thank Allegra uh, for raising um, the awareness that, that that was happening so quickly. Um, okay, uh, Rob, you have a hand up. Um, you said it was uh, on the website somewhere. I, I didn't, where is that? Yeah, so I had to dig a little. Um, so if you go uh, onto the uh, town website and uh, up in the finance committee, it was actually part of the agenda, I believe, uh, for last Tuesday. And uh, I just have to say, I find it very, very difficult to find things on the website. I'd have to dig a little bit. Um, but uh, we actually got an article where it's embedded in the article. So that was my first way of getting in. And then I worked backwards to figure out how yeah. to get in there. If you go to the finance committee webpage and you scroll to the bottom, it says meeting packets. You know, you have to click on that and then it's sorted by date, by year folder and then meeting date. Yep. And it's the most uh, recent meeting date in 24. But yeah, I think, you know, I would, I often tell people just to keyword search the website and see you know, what comes up because it might help direct you faster. If, you know, if you, for instance, if we didn't know what meeting date that was discussed, you might have to click through a lot of folders, but. Um, February 6th. Yeah. Just, uh, I'll send it to Greg, the link to Greg, and he can send it to everybody. So you can Thank easily you, access it. Thank you, Paul. And that will be the prior uh, policy as well as the current one. Thank you. Uh, Grover? Well, I was going to ask somebody to, to like, do a pop education and just share your screen and show us navigating that because this is the kind of, yeah, it's like, should not be difficult. You know, we should all hopefully have the be ability to be like, oh, that's actually a policy I really care about. I want to be able to quickly. Thank sure. you. Yeah, um, I, uh, let me just back out. So if you, is that, let me, uh, sorry, my toolbar is in the way. Is that visible for everyone? Yes, it is visible. Yeah, I'll just so we are at the home page, Amherst, the um, the web homepage for the town. If you went to right, so some of it's like inside baseball, like where do you go? So mm -hmm. you know, if you're like, oh, what's the where's the finance committee? You might, you know, that might be one place to start. If you know it's a part of the town council, uh, you can go to all council committees, and then you know, council committees, it's finance committee. 
And then, so, right. So if this is what you see, you're like, well, where do I, what do I, how do I know? And you just, you know, you have to scroll down to the bottom here where they have meeting packets and agendas. Again, you know, another um, click. And then it's a, <clears throat> the way it's set up, you know, like I said, it's a chronological listing of meeting dates. And so, you know, if you know that it was discussed, you know, at, you know, clicking through this 24 and then this, meeting date, you can see the agenda items. I mean, that's why I said oftentimes I would just go up here in the search bar and you could type, you know, and see what, what comes up, you know, if that, I, you know, um, and then you can see where it says, you know, February 5th, 24, at least it gives you some direction. Um, and then if we click on it, it should just bring right to probably what was the document, but yeah, I mean, it's something that, you have to, uh, it might take a little bit of searching, but that's, you know, I would start on the home page and then kind of work your way down through it. Uh, and you can always, you know, yeah, I, the previous IT director said it was like, you know, <laughs> oh, it's unfortunate. It's like two clicks in three seconds is the attention span of someone when they're trying to search a website. But, you know, I think the search function is really useful. And then, um, you know, that keyword search is, is I think really comes up with, what's really relevant in recent documents up top. So to me, that's something to start with if you're not really sure. Thank you, Nate. Um, and it, it's definitely worth reading the comments from the different uh, finance committee members. Um, okay, um, at this point, we're at public comments. Any public comments? I just want to make one, which is thank you, John, Grace, and Sam for being here. And I know uh, there was one other person. Oh, Laura was here for a little while and left. Laura Baker. Okay. Okay. Any items not anticipated within 48 hours? All right. Uh, future agenda items. Um, I know that I have raised a couple of times wanting to hear from the Amherst Heritage uh, Reparations Assembly. And I know I had reached out and um, I had reached out twice uh, and did not get anything back. Uh, Allegra, I know you said you would reach out. Have you been able to, uh, I know that you made contact with Michelle and that they're interested. Do you know if they've picked a date that they want to come to the trust? I have not heard back. I gave her the dates of the March and April meetings going on the assumption that it would be the second Thursday of those two months. Um, right. And then I have not heard a response. Oh, thank you. Would you be willing to follow up again? Yes. Thank you. And uh, okay, uh, there's a hand up. Carol, go ahead. Me, I, I was just uh, uh, informally. I saw Michelle at the uh, opening of the reopening of the ancestral bridges thing, and she talked about looking forward to coming and planning on. I don't know whether it was March or April, but I believe that she's planning on one of those. So Allegra, I expect you'll get a good answer from her when you talk to her. Yep. And just for those of you um, who might not have been here when we talked about it. Um, uh, I, I went to the present, well, actually, I listened to the town council presentation. It was a four-hour meeting, which was phenomenal, but it was a long meeting. Um, and they did a presentation there. Um, and I've also read um, the report. There are recommendations there with regard to affordable housing, um, you know, as part of their recommendations. And what we would like to talk to them about is um, have them talk to us about what they're thinking about with regard to that, especially as we're planning our, you know, our action plan for the next uh, three to five years. So we just thought it would be really important uh, to have them come and share with us uh, their thoughts, their vision regarding affordable housing and the recommendations. And I know there were some challenges uh, that we had talked about too, in terms of uh, the whole concept of fair housing and also uh, being responsive to um, their report and their recommendations. So, um, and thinking about how we can, uh, how we can manage both of that. Okay, any other comments? 
Otherwise, our next regular meeting will be March 14th, so every second um, uh, Thursday of the month, so it's March 14th, and we are meeting on February 29th for our action planning meeting. Um, as uh, we mentioned before, it will be at five o'clock and it will be uh, in the town room in town hall. Um, and I have had one um, request regarding food, but if you have any um, questions or concerns about the pizza that Shelly's going to bring, please let me know. Okay. So I'm going to ask if there are any comments, questions. Otherwise, at 821, I'm going to close the meeting and adjourn and thank all of you for being here this evening and looking forward to seeing all of you on February 29th. And if you have any questions about the materials, please let Carol, Greg, and I know. And thank you very much, Shelly, for joining us as well. Bye, okay. everyone. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thank Thanks. Good night. Thank you. That was a fast meeting. It was. Good <laughs> job. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, it goes very fast. <laughs> I was, um, I, I'm, I, so. But we still have a 